Coming up on Market to Market. Pope Francis comes to America, preaching on the perils of climate change. Plus, a new chapter in the story of the little grouse on the prairie. And uncertainty continues to hamper new investments for renewable fuels. Those stories and market analysis with Ted Seifert, next. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. This is the Friday, September 25 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Mike Pearson. Two highly identifiable world figures called on the United States this week asking for change, with the most recent guest being the president of China. Xi Jinping and President Obama announced plans Friday to not conduct or support cyber attacks. Another point of emphasis involved the limiting of greenhouse gases. The two superpowers have already agreed to serve as world leaders on the issue. China said it will commit $3.1 billion to help developing countries reduce carbon emissions. The U.S. already pledged a similar amount to the cause. The other official state visit this week came from the Bishop of Rome. He, too, urged movement on the contentious issue of the environment. It was a week of firsts in Washington, D.C., as Pope Francis set foot in the U.S. for the first time, kicking off a six-day, three-city visit. The first stop was to the White House, where the Holy Father delivered his message about climate change on the South Lawn with President Obama. Climate change is a problem we can no longer be left to a future generation. The Pope of the Holy See! Another first came on Wednesday when the 78-year-old pontiff was the first pope to address a joint meeting of Congress. The speech covered a multitude of topics, ranging from immigration and the poor to climate change and the environment. We need a conversation which includes everyone, since the environmental challenge we are undergoing and its human roots concern and affect us all. The Pope made a point of reiterating the contents of his early spring encyclical, Laudato Si, where he called for the world's attention to focus on issues affecting climate change. I call for a courageous and responsible effort to redirect our steps and to avert the most serious effects of the environmental deterioration caused by human activity. I'm convinced that we can make a difference. I'm sure. And Acres damaged by wildfires topped the 9 million mark this week as more than 48,000 active blazes have been reported this year, the fastest pace since 2006. A measure containing $700 million in emergency funding to suppress the flames is tied up in negotiations to keep the government open as a budget deadline looms. But with Speaker of the House John Boehner's retirement, that assistance could be further lost in transition. One government agency did move forward on a policy this week that helped write a new chapter in the story of the little grouse on the prairie. Federal officials this week announced that recent conservation efforts have eased threats to the greater sage grouse enough that the rangeland bird will not be placed on the endangered species list. The decision had long been anticipated and feared by some, as the listing would likely have limited use of federal land in parts of 11 western states, potentially affecting ranchers, recreational users, and energy companies. In making the announcement in Colorado, U.S. Interior Secretary Sally Jewell described as unprecedented the recent combined efforts of government leaders ranchers and nonprofits to protect the bird's habitat and avoid having the bird listed. This is the largest, most complex, 
land conservation ever, uh, effort ever in the history of the United States of America, perhaps the world. Since 1985, the number of greater sage grouse, a chicken sized bird that feeds mainly on sagebrush, has declined an estimated 30% to somewhere between 200 and 500,000. Experts point to disruption or fragmentation of nesting areas as the primary problem. The four biggest factors behind fragmentation, depending on the region, are conifer trees pushing out sagebrush, invasive grasses that feed wildfires, developments related to oil, gas, and wind energy, and conversion of rangeland to crop production. The greater sage grouse is viewed as an indicator species, whose long-term viability may reflect the overall health of the range habitat. The greater sage grouse range includes 173 million acres in 11 states, a territory 10 times larger than that of the northern spotted owl, which was listed as threatened on the endangered species list in 1990. The sage grouse was going to be the spotted owl for the livestock grazing industry. You know, we saw the the way the spotted owl, the impact that that had on on the timber industry in the, in the 80s, and that was the fear. State and local government officials, many of whom were involved in conservation efforts as they feared the economic losses that would stem from the bird being listed, applauded the decision. In Montana in particular, where the vast majority of sage grouse habitat is on private property, this announcement's good news for property rights of farmers, ranchers, and other landowners. The Interior Department reported that threats to the greater sage grouse have been reduced across 90% of the bird's breeding habitat in recent years. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, which is charged with protecting species that may be threatened, had decided in 2005 that the greater sage grouse did not warrant listing. Several environmental groups sued, however, and a federal judge in 2007 ordered the Fish and Wildlife Service to reconsider. The agency decided in 2010 to protect the bird, but western states were given a grace period for conservation efforts. This week, within days of the September 30th deadline, Fish and Wildlife officials announced their decision to set aside plans to list the bird. In making the announcement, however, the federal government did release new federal land management plans to help better protect the grouse's habitat, with particular focus on 12 million acres considered the most critical to the grouse. 64 percent of the current greater sage-grouse territory is federally owned. The Center for Biological Diversity, one of the groups that sued, responded this week that the decision appears to be based on, quote, half measures and generally weak management plans. The group said in a news release, there's no question that the Obama administration put an enormous amount of work into this process, and it deserves credit for that. But in the end, this decision seems more based on political science than biological science. The organization argues, for example, that in Wyoming, where 40% of the remaining greater sage-grouse population resides, fossil fuel sites should be set back at a greater distance from nesting areas than is currently planned. However, others argue that the decision has shown that groups who are sometimes at odds over such environmental issues can work together to improve habitats. It's nice to know that we're recognized as, as the work that we've done in, in conserving wildlife habitat for the sage-grouse. I think this shows that private property owners have, have been willing to step up to the plate, do these things voluntarily, do things voluntarily to, to keep the bird from being listed, and most importantly, to, to recognize that they are an important species in the West and that we are willing to protect them. Fewer people were buying homes in August, even with low mortgage rates and solid job growth. The National Association of Realtors said this, said this week sales of existing homes fell 4.8 percent from July, which was the highest in more than eight years. Business investment plans took a hit as orders for durable goods dropped 2 percent. The measure of long-lasting manufactured goods fell on a stronger dollar and China's economic slowdown. Caterpillar announced it may cut more than 10,000 workers over the next three years. The Peoria, Illinois-based large equipment maker cha cited challenges in the mining and energy sectors. 
Federal Reserve Chair Janet Yellen said late this week that the central bank was still likely to raise interest rates this year, mostly on speculation that global economic weakness won't be significant enough to alter plans. And the Dow Jones Industrial Average experienced a 500-point swing to close lower for the week, mostly on pressure from China's manufacturing index, dropping to a a three-and-a-half-year low. However, a late rally for financial stocks helped get the Dow close to even on the week. Part of the drag on Wall Street is lower energy prices. Oil continues to trade in the $40 range, putting a damper on the expansion of renewable fuels. Earlier this year, the Environmental Protection Agency proposed lowering the mandates for alternative fuels based on what officials saw as limited supplies and reductions in use of the predominantly corn-based additive. David Miller explains. This week, several of the players in the ethanol industry met in Des Moines, Iowa to discuss the future of ethanol. What is the right level of blend of ethanol? Is it 20 percent? Is it 15 percent? Is it 30 percent? Up for discussion were several topics, including the distribution of E15, a mix of 15% ethanol and 85% unleaded gasoline, and the effect of the delay by the federal government on making a decision about major cuts to the renewable fuel standard. Jeff Lout, CEO of Poet, was the keynote speaker at the event. And if we could just let the policy just stay in place as it was originally passed and allow companies like ours to to go full speed ahead, we could do so much more good. And I think that's what's frustrating for me and for, for our team of people is, is we see so much possibilities that could be created if we could just get this uncertainty out of the way that the government keeps creating with the RFS. Also, Loud thinks government support of advanced biofuels needs to remain in place, and he would like to see higher ethanol blends like E15 get their day in the sun. They should want the same thing we want, which is the best thing for Americans, and let's let them have choice. And let's, let, let's put our products side by side at the pump, and let's let Americans choose at the end of the day. Into the, marketplace. the ethanol and biodiesel industries were well represented, as well as a few groups that have supported the production of all fuels, but not necessarily federal renewable fuel mandates. There's opportunities to get into the retail business and... and, and uh, the American Petroleum Institute a national trade association representing all aspects of the oil and natural gas industry, has consistently maintained it would like to see the RFS repealed, calling the policy unworkable. However, API members are stuck in the same line as ethanol producers, waiting for confirmation of any federal policy changes. You know, refiners, obligated parties who are also importers, are being asked to comply uh, with something that had, is, is two years old. You know, 2014, it hasn't, we don't have, num- we don't know what numbers were supposed to come out and, and uh, uh, you know, what our obligations are from that. Uh, we don't know what our numbers are for 2015, and that's not going to be told until a month before the end of the year. And even in light of several studies to the contrary, API has only supported a limit on ethanol of E10 in late model cars. The automobile manufacturers are the guys that will tell you whether or not they built the car for a uh, for E10 or E15, and I'm going to trust those guys before I trust the EPA any day. That's what they do. Debate over how much to blend into America's fuel supply and the amount of federal support needed to advance the industry will likely continue long after EPA makes a decision in November on changes to the renewable fuel standard. For Market to Market, I'm David Miller. Next, the Market to Market Report. A late week equity markets rally helped pull up commodities. For the week, December wheat increased a quarter, while the nearby corn contract gained more than a dime. A combined announcement of China buying 13.1 million metric tons of soybeans and good equity market strength shot the November contract up 22 cents for the week. December meal prices went along for the ride, adding 40 cents per ton. In the softs, December cotton mustered a 9 cent gain per hundred weight. Over in the dairy parlor, another down week as the October Class 3 milk futures declined 28 cents. It was like deja vu all over again in the livestock sector as the October cattle contract dropped $2.30. October feeders fell off $1.23, but the October lean hog contract again bucked the trend by increasing $1.63. 
In the currency markets, the U.S. dollar index gained nearly 1.5%. October crude traded higher with an 18 cent gain. COMEX Gold advanced 7.80 per ounce. And the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index progressed one point to settle at 3.59 even. Here now to lend us his insight on these and other trends is one of our regular market analysts, Ted Seifert. Ted, welcome back. Hey, thanks for having me. We're glad to have you. And we want to start this session uh, off with a question from one of our Twitter followers. And we encourage all of you to follow us on Twitter and Facebook at market to market This is from Jared in Oklahoma. He's wondering, as a producer, how long will it take before hard red winter wheat prices aren't absolutely horrible? Right. And hi, Jared. By the way, at the Ted spread. Uh, <laughs> Wheat has a problem. Uh, we have a lot of global composition. And one of a few things, there's a few possible things that can happen for wheat to turn this thing around. But with the strong dollar, there's a competitive advantage for countries to go elsewhere for their wheat. With the subsidies that are coming from other countries, uh, they're able to sell wheat at lower prices. So that puts us in a very sticky situation, and we don't really have the export sales to justify higher wheat prices because the ending stocks continue to build. But if we were to have a production issue somewhere in the world, could really be anywhere, uh, could be El Nino related with another strong El Nino predicted into um, spring of next year, could be Australia for that matter, uh, that would certainly help things. Uh, if we had a big drop in the dollar when they raise rates, if, if, if the dollar says, okay, a quarter's already been factored in, now we can drop 300 points, 400 points, that will help things. Uh, if row crops started to rally a bit, that could help things as well. So. There's a number of things that, that could happen for the wheat, but until one of those things happens and we can get that export sale machine rolling again, we're going to be in a tough spot as far as higher wheat prices. Well, now we did see in the Chicago benchmark 25 cent gain in the wheat market this week on top of the International Grain Council raising global uh, total ending wheat stocks by 5 million metric tons. Yes. What sparked that move up this week? We have some weather concerns that are cropping up. Now, I don't think these are going to be things that eventually really affect production. Uh, we have some spotty sort of weather concerns here, but mostly Russia and the Ukraine and some dryness in there. They're one rain away from that going away, and there's okay. a little bit better forecast, which uh, kind of cooled things off yesterday a little bit. Sell this rally? We went along for the ride today because of the soybean rally. Uh, yeah, I, I think right now that's kind of what we're looking at, uh, unless we really kind of uh, develop into a bigger weather story sometime in the near future. But I, I think we're going to have a tough time for for right now. Little pops give you some sales opportunities to yeah, take them as they so. come. All right. Well, now let's jump into this corn market up 11 cents on the week. Tell us where you think this is going here as we get into harvest. You really like how corn has performed. Even when soybeans were challenging contract lows earlier in the week, corn really didn't want to have a whole lot to do with that. Uh, on down days, we end up kind of coming back towards unchanged by the end of the day. On up days, we end up closing up near highs. So you can kind of see the price action in corn is maybe turning a little bit more positive. Uh, as we look at the USDA's yield and acreage number combined for their for their production number, um, I, I'm not going to sit and argue yield. I'm not going to sit and argue acres. What I will do is I ar will argue production. One or the other has to change because either we got to cut out the big skips that we have, the big drowned out areas that we have all over Illinois and Indiana and Missouri, or uh, we zero that out and, and leave the, the yield well, or we don't zero it out and the yield comes down. Either way, I think the corn production, the crop that we have out there is somewhere between a 13.3 and a 13.4 billion bushel crop, billion bushel crop, which means somewhere between two and 300 uh, million bushels could be coming off the production side of the corn balance sheet. Uh, so for me, uh, although I do think we'll see maybe some small reductions lower in demand, I think our, our carryover could end up somewhere between a 1.2 and a 1.4 rather than the 1.6 yeah. we're at right now. Uh, so I'm friendly corn prices. I think we put a harvest low in corn sometime in the relatively near future if we haven't already. Uh, I see corn uh, starting a rising tide in, in grain prices here for the next couple of months. And I, I'm optimistic that corn can get into the low to mid fours uh, by November, late November, December time frame into the first quarter of next year. Don't be real excited to sell it right off the combine. <laughs> Not right off the combine. However, I think we want to be careful again about what happens when we get to January and February time frame because if South America has gotten planted, although Argentina and Brazil are looking to reduce corn acres and increase bean acres, um, but if everything's looking good, they've got planted all right, their weather looks good, uh, you could see some pressure mainly coming from the soybeans, which could take a new leg lower if everything is you know, all well and good in South America. 
that's when I get a little worried that corn prices could start coming down. Follow suit. As well, yeah. So I think we're going to have a time frame here where we can be optimistic for corn, look for some higher prices. Um, if, I'm, if I've got storage and I'm trying to make some decisions here, I'm more friendly on storing corn at the moment. Uh, so I, I think that's, um, that's the best bet for, the, for now. All right. Well, let's talk soybeans. In the news a lot this week, especially yeah. at the tail end Big of the week. week. Big promise of a sale to China. Ted, tell us a little bit about what we saw with this big Chinese purchase and what it means for the market. Okay, so 13.18 million metric tons was purchased by China uh, while the delegation was here in Des Moines uh, this week. That is split between 24 different contracts. Um, the, only, the only piece of that business that we saw on Friday morning's export report, the USDA reports sales of over 100 million metric tons, or 100,000 metric tons. We saw 240 or 260 to China this morning of that. And it's a very small drop in the bucket. Uh, so for me, that was a little bit disappointing. Uh, but a lot of these contracts seem to be contracts that will be priced uh, and delivered later. So uh, it's sort of a promissory, promise ring sort of uh, showing from China. Uh, really, I mean, you look at what China's done while they've been here with Boeing, uh, and with with the you know buying basically all of Iowa soybeans, <laughs> um, it's good to see. I think China is on a foreign relations mission here. I think they're trying to have a very warm and fuzzy visit uh, and do these photo op mm-hmm. things that uh, that they're able to do to ease some tensions over cybersecurity and the sure. islands in the South Pacific. Uh, but I'm not sure this ultimately leads to bigger exports to China this year than what we were originally expecting or what uh, what the USDA was originally expecting. Okay. The number that they have out there, that's about half of what we need them to, to import from us this year in order to hit the USDA's export. So hopefully we'll see China step in and buy throughout this seat, throughout this marketing year. Now, as growers are sitting in the combine and they're looking at, I'm going to store my corn. Yeah. How do I handle my beans in this situation? We've got a question, another question from a Twitter follower. This is Kyle in Iowa. Should an operation sell soybeans at harvest and buy calls? He's heard that out in the coffee shop. Good question, Uma. That's a, it's an interesting thing because uh, when we talk about flat price, the idea is that soybean prices could go down over time um, because there's, I, I think, a lot more potential bearish news for soybeans with, with harvest uh, or with yields coming in a little bit better than expected. The potential is that we could be near where the USDA is on production. Um, I get a little worried about soybean prices sliding lower after an initial harvest bump. Uh, so in that respect, yes, I do like that idea. Um, I would sell them and then maybe own some fairly inexpensive calls to reown those bushels if we do get a rally, if South America has an issue. But the problem there is basis because you're really selling into the worst basis possible. Right. But you're going to have that same problem with corn. So it's sort of pick your poison. Um, I'm choosing to, I would like to store corn yep. uh, and sell beans off the combine. And if you want to reown, reown the bushels. The I like using calls, limited right. risk there. Well, now let's jump into the livestock market, particularly the cattle side. Yes. Uh, watching a tennis match this week, <laughs> back and forth and up and down. Wow. Tell us what can we expect come Monday morning after a limit up day on Friday. Oh, it's boy. Uh, <laughs> limit down, I suppose. No, I, I don't know. That's It's very interesting. I'm hoping we see some follow through up. Uh, and I think Monday morning when we first open, we will see that likely. Uh, what we do after that is the question. Where we close Monday is a very good question. What should we be looking for? I wouldn't be supi- surprised to start higher and then kind of simmer down a little bit on Monday. At some point, the dust has to settle a little bit here, and I don't think we should really blow through uh, after really pushing the range down and going all the way right back up quite yet. I think we should calm down and maybe drift and wait for the next bigger move to, to happen. But uh, the last couple of days have been interesting. We were limit down on Wednesday. That expanded the ranges for Thursday. We were limit down Thursday. You had buyers come in um, having to buy for margin call reasons. You had, you had <clears throat> on, on top of that, that started a little bit of a technical buying opportunity. Uh, then we had some short covering for whoever had been short for the previous day or two or two weeks for that matter, looking at very good prices and technically being oversold. Uh, but then really today more so, and part of the reason we were limit up and good volume today, the Packers are stepping in and buying here, maybe doing a little bit of bottom picking. I think that is optimistic going forward. I like seeing that. That being said, weakness in products is a concern. I'm not sure we're done with that. So I think we could kind of remain sort of volatile here. Maybe the lows in for now, 
Uh, but I'm not sure we should be going straight higher here quite yet either. Feeder cattle, you guys see guys stepping in and bottom picking here in this feeder cattle market, or is this just a ledge on the downward travel? Um, yeah, that's a very good question. I, you know, I think to some extent it is a ledge. Longer term, I, I'm friendly feeder cattle, but in the next couple of months, I still think things can kind of come back down a little bit. So I think that is a ledge. I do think there's some selling opportunities in here. Especially Look to hedge spring calves against this price today. Yes, yes, I like that idea. And yes, and, and again, I, I think we can open a little bit higher early next week, Monday, uh, but I'd be a little skeptical of any continued strength early next week. All right. Now let's talk the hog market. Again, up on the week, defied gravity of the rest of the livestock markets. Sure. Mm -hmm. How much longer can this hog market run? That's a great question. Um, yeah. You have your reasons for hogs going higher. Uh, for me in particular, it's the idea of increased exports. China's uh, reduced their hog herd by 6.5%, biggest reduction in quite some time. Uh, so we like where we're going with exports. The problem that I have is that if beef prices continue to come down, you got to worry a little bit about your domestic demand. So I, I think we could stay relatively strong versus cattle and versus beef, but you have to be a little bit weary of a continued uptrend in, in the hogs. Although we really do, from a technical perspective, have a very nice basing pattern that we've put in uh, over the past four or five months. So I think lows are in for hogs. I'm just a little concerned that this is going to be an off-to-the-races rally uh, because, again, beef competition might be the thorn in the side of hogs at this point. Probably looking at a 5 to 7 7 to $10 dollar range in this hog market? Yeah, I think that's a reasonable expectation at this point. Okay. Now, Ted, just before we let you go, dollar this next week, up or down? Hmm, that's a good question. I, you know, I think that uh, we are starting to maybe top out on the dollar. Maybe until we, we, we do raise rates, the dollar will maybe find some more strength. All right. Uh, you saw that big key reversal in yep. Brazilian real, which is interesting for, for soybeans, too. We'll pick up that on the Market Plus. Thank you, Ted. Absolutely. That wraps up this edition of Market to Market. But Ted and I will continue our discussion and answer some of your questions in the Market Plus segment available on our website. You'll also find audio podcasts of the discussion as well as streaming video of the program exclusively at that Market to Market website. You can also interact with us through Twitter and Facebook. So until next time, thanks for watching. I'm Mike Pearson. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com.